Hey there, everybody. Bob Beatty Barr here, and welcome to episode eight of the My Friends Are Amazing podcast. This week, me and my special guest cover everything from tornadoes, stand-up comedy, and truck driving. But first, let's catch up on some podcast news. Last week's episode with Lillian pushed us well toward our goal of a thousand listens to the podcast. Just want to say thanks to Lillian for being my guest last week, and I think this week's episode is going to even put us closer. Just a reminder to everyone that you can find episodes of this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and tune in radio. Just search My Friends Are Amazing. Heck, do it on Google and just add podcast to the end and boom. Pick your favorite podcast network and hit that subscribe button. Also, crazy new feature we discovered this week. Uh, for all of you digital voice assistant junkies, you can just say, Alexa, play My Friends Are Amazing podcast on tune in radio. Give it a try. It's fun. Today, the podcast is brought to you by Social Imposter. Reputation management for social networking profiles. Social Imposter is a customized service utilizing proprietary technology that finds and mitigates the removal of fake social network pages on behalf of high profile brands, actors, athletes, models, musicians, politicians, military officers, business people, members of the clergy, and their management teams. So basically, if you have social media profiles and you are concerned that people might be impersonating you online, that could be actually dangerous to your users or even actually take money from them. You want to reach out to Social Imposter to have them find those fake pages and have them removed. Uh, today's podcast is also brought to you by The Bob and Kevin Show. The Bob and Kevin Show streams live on YouTube every Monday morning at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. And this week, I believe we are filming episode four. We have some great new show graphics and uh, some new technology that we're bringing to the show. Uh, we help you kick off each week covering tech topics. We have a special quiz where we quiz each other and uh, tons of other special segments. Uh, we're actually covering a lot of net neutrality and Bitcoin these days. So be sure to check us out on YouTube and you can always find the link to the live stream at BeattyBar.com. Well, today my guest is the one and only John Coulter. What is there left to be said about John Coulter that the history books will not reveal to us? In a world of gray and black, John Coulter is a bright red tassel. He lives by the ancient Tibetan philosophy, don't start one, won't be none. He's an Eagle Scout, a fourth degree black belt, 30 year truck driver, and a stand up comic. He's also a loving and devoted husband and friend. And in one time in Tasmania, he punched Russell Crowe in the face. The conundrum that is John Coulter is simply unraveled by the phrase, let's get a beer. Congratulations to everyone that has had the pleasure of meeting him. So enough with the reading and the promos and the intros. Let's just meet my guest this week on My Friends Are Amazing, John Coulter. So, John, how's it going? Uh, good, good. Things are going great. Um <sighs> uh, My birthday is coming up. I'm going to be 50. And the big five zero. Yes, yes. We celebrated Sunday's birthday in New York. Uh, that's what she wanted to do. We went to a, a real nice um, French restaurant. Was it French or Swiss? Uh, with the melted cheese. Did you see the thing we posted with Nick and Amy, I the videos? I did. It looked like you guys spent a shit ton of money. That's what it looked like. <laughs> yeah, but it was still, it was it was delicious. And it was really cool. And, and uh from the moment she saw the video of that on Facebook, uh, she was like, yeah, we got to go there. We got to try that. So, uh, yeah, that's, you know, we went and did that uh, with Nick and Amy from uh, Scandia from from Rhode Island. Uh, Tuesday was Nick's birthday and Wednesday was Sunday's. So it was nice. You know, it was nice seeing them. Um we are going to Iceland for my 50th birthday. And that's in, that's in December, right? Yeah, my birthday is the 23rd, but we're going in February to see the Aurora Borealis. Nice. Yeah, so Sunday found that and she was like, hey, you know, the tickets are, it's it's like two grand, uh, two grand a couple, 1800 for a couple for a week in Reykjavik, uh, airfare, hotel, um, car, the hotel is a four-star hotel. 
Um, she was just like, let's just go live it up for a week. I'm, you know, who am I to argue? You only you know? turned 50 once. Last I checked. I only turned 50 once. Yeah. Yeah. I feel bad because when she turned 50, I, I took her with a bunch of our friends. And we went to escape the room challenge. Um, that's what she wanted to do. But when I turned 50, she's like, hey, I want to go to Iceland. So, we're, you know, it's kind of like she wants to go to Iceland. So she's using my birthday as the I was going to say as the catalyst. The key is that she said she wants to go to Iceland. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. It's. Yeah. I'm just she's pimping me out. And that's just how that goes. Well, that's I, all that it is. I want to dive into something completely different because in your bio, there's one line that stands out. Uh you punch Russell Crowe in the face. So yes. I think we gotta I think we have to launch just we have to go deep right off the bat. So what's up with this Russell okay. Crowe punch in the face story? Uh true true statement, true story. Um no lie. I, I did get into a fist fight with the, the actor Russell Crowe from Gladiator. Uh we were in Australia for our honeymoon. And uh, we were traveling all over the continent and we found ourselves in Tasmania for three and a half days. And we were at the Rest Point Hotel and Casino, W-R-E-S-T, in Hobart, Tasmania. And the, the guy at the counter was Christopher. Um, and he was very proper. You know, yes, Mr. Coulter. Hello, Mr. Coulter. How are you, sir? It's good to see you, Mr. Coulter. We don't get many people from the United States here. He was, they were, he was genuinely happy to meet people from America. Uh, we were like an oddity there. And, uh, I got talking with him, real nice guy. Um, he was from Brisbane, Australia. And it just so happens that Brisbane was in the Australian rules. Football, fun, uh, their their grand finale, their grand prix. Oh yeah! And I I would call him up and say, "Hey, Christopher, what's going on? I, you know, explain this to me and help me understand this." So he helped me understand it. I was watching it every time Brisbane scored. I called him and said, "Hey, they scored again." You know, um, he was a big big Brisbane Lions fan, and so the first time I called him and they said they scored knock on the door and here's a bottle of champagne. And I called him again and then it was free dinner. And he just kept sending us stuff. He, you know, we, we got along real well. And one of the things he sent us was a, uh, a set of tickets to go see a local band called 40 odd feet of grunts. <laughs> and that's, that's the name of the band that Russell Crowe sings for. That's a he mouthful. Did. Yeah. And I'll tell you, we were having a rock and good time with them. They, you know, he he was he was living out his rock star dreams, Biggity, and he was doing really well. I mean, the music was good to the point where I said the Sunday we should buy one or two of their CDs because these guys were good. You know, oh, we, wow. were having, we were having a great time, and somebody threw a pair of underwear on the stage. A, a woman, <laughs> and. Uh, Russell Crowe just out of the blue says, you know, I have to watch this because I get a lot of underwear from American women and they're big and fat and diseased and American women are skanks and whores. And, and I'm sitting there with an old Navy t-shirt with an American flag on it, Holy shit. standing next to my wife. And my wife goes, Hey, asshole, tell us how your movie did outside of America. How much money did you make? And Russell Crowe, not knowing me or my wife, says, why don't you shut up, bitch? Uh, or skank or whatever he said. And so then I couldn't let that stand. I'm on my honeymoon with my wife. And uh, so I knew that it would piss him off. So I called him a Kiwi, <laughs> uh, you know, because he's Australian. He's not New Zealand. And he's telling me how uh, he said something like my lawyer suggests I don't come off the stage. And I said, I suggest you don't because I'm going to punch the shit out of you, you limey fuck and blah, 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 back and forth. And he came off the stage and he grabbed me and he hit me and I hit him and we went down and it was kind of like a two punch fight. He hit me, I hit him or I hit him, he hit me. Uh, we rolled around a little bit. And people pulled us apart and, you know, uh, we left the concert venue and we went to a, a lobby bar and we hung out there and there was. 
half a dozen people that came with us and we were drinking, having a great time. And uh, Sunday was all upset because she thought I was going <laughs> to spend the night in a Tasmanian prison, you know. <laughs> but for me, I was like, what a great story. This is a great story. But if I had gotten arrested right. and spent a night in a Tasmanian jail, what kind of great story is that? You know, turns out the manager comes over and says, oh, we're going to we're having a private party. You have to leave. And I told him no. Uh, unless Russell Crowe comes and asks me to leave personally. Um, so we stayed there till three in the morning. No Russell Crowe, no nothing. Uh, we leave. Uh, we get up the next morning. Uh, all the staff is like, oh, my God, that's the guy. Uh, oh, my God. How are you? Good morning. <laughs> Shake it. I was like a celebrity because I hit So him. everyone. He, he treats, treats everyone treats, like shit. He treats people like shit, Bob. And, and everybody... Everybody, everybody hated them. And they were all like, they, they were just, you know, oh my God, you know, you're, you're like a cowboy. You're like John Wayne and Clint Eastwood. And I'm like, shut up, Neelix. Um, oh my God, this is amazing. This is great. So we had purchased the this book of vouchers. Uh, it was $20 for a room. And our first night there, our room was... In sort of like the basement, and it was right next to the laundry service. So the wall was hot, and you heard bung, 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 bung from the wash, the washer and dryer. Bum, bum, bum. And we didn't That sounds care about right for 20 bucks a night. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, the next morning, Russell Crowe, we go to breakfast. I see Christopher. He, he He's like fanning over me like a fanboy, you know, like just, he's just amazing. Um, he has our bags moved and he has us moved oh, to wow. the penthouse on the sixth floor. The, the building was only six floors high. The biggest building in Tasmania is only six floors high. Um, he has us moved to the penthouse and he, he tears up uh, the, the voucher that we have. It's, don't worry about it. So the next day we get our bill and it's like $385. And he goes, oh, yeah, that's not a problem. He ripped it in half. Wow. Yeah, $20 is fine. Go ahead. Thanks. Thanks for staying, stay up there as long as you want, you know? So it was, it was cool, but it, it's a true, uh, a true story. Yeah. I, I was involved in a fist fight with Russell Crowe. Yeah. You know, when I was younger. So did you have any other, uh, any other less violent, uh, encounters with celebrities? Uh, I mean, I'm hoping they were all less violent. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I met Bridget Nielsen once before I met my wife when she was dating Mark Gastineau. Uh, the the Eagles and the Jets had a scrimmage up at Lehigh, and my dad and brother and I went up, and Bridget Nielsen was there, and uh, she was coming up to the booth, and we were sitting up in the nosebleed sections at the Lehigh uh, field, and uh, everyone was hassling her, and I stood up and was like, hey, leave her alone. Everyone sit down. Stop. And she got it. She gave, she got a picture with me. Um, uh, 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 one of the old time cameras that, you know, you put the little, Oh yeah. The, uh, the cube flash on the top. Yeah. It was one of those. So I don't even know where that picture got to, but, uh, she was really young. It was right after she shot Cobra with Stallone. Is that why they were harassing her uh, or. Yeah. You know, they, well, she's a celebrity and oh my God, oh, this okay. beautiful, right. she's gigantic. She's huge. Um, let's see. I shook hands. I met, uh, uh, the big show from WWE. I met Howard Stern. You know, I met, uh, Bam Margera a couple of times. I met Bon Jovi once. Nice. Um, when we were, we were down at the Philadelphia Soul and, uh, Bam Margera uh, was there with, uh, Bon Jovi in his booth and we got tickets uh, in the booth that was like two, maybe three booths, uh, uh, the, the luxury suite. We were two or three luxury suites down. So we were waving to them and all that. And uh, we went out to the elevator to go down and they made us wait and they came out and it just so happens that a friend of mine is friends with Bam. So that's how I sort of know. Oh, no way. Yeah. Anthony Garbarino is friends with Bam. So I was like, Hey, you know, you know, aunt, you remember me? Oh, hey, Mr. Bon Jovi. Hey, blah, blah, blah. You know, 
nice enough guy, you know, shook my hand and jumped on the elevator and we had to wait because, you know, of course, they're not going to make Bon Jovi wait for the elevator. They're going to make us. So. <laughs> <laughs> no. But uh, I'm not, you know. So were you in the. Go ahead. Were you in the luxury suite? Were you in the luxury suite as a, a maestros thing or was this pre maestros? Uh, this is way pre maestros. Um, uh, back when I was training in Taekwondo and I was teaching uh, one of one of my closest friends and uh, a student that I talk to still every day, Nick. I don't know if you ever heard me talk about Nick. Uh, he's a special needs kid. Uh, well, I can't say kid. Yeah, he's going to turn 30 this year. And I've known him since he was, God, like 14, 15. Um, and I was his martial arts instructor. And we talk every day. I talk to him today. Uh, his dad, the company that his dad worked for at the time, uh, they they owned a luxury suite at the, the uh, Wachovia Center. So he used to get his tickets as long as we took Nick, you know, WWE and Soul Football and uh, concerts. And uh, we went to an American sumo tournament there and just all kinds of oh, stuff. Wow. You know, he used to get his tickets and we would go. Yeah, it was it was a cool hookup. Uh, but then he retired and that that disappeared. So how old were you when you got into martial arts since we've kind of bridged over to that? Uh, let's see. I trained for 17 years oh, wow. with Master Mike. Yeah. Um, I'd say I was in my late 20s, uh, 28, something like that. It was OK, like, but so came to it as an adult. Yeah. Yeah. It was not a little kid thing for me. Um, one of my friends uh, was working at, at uh, West Coast Video and they had a, a, a cardboard sign hanging from the ceiling. And he was already training in, in Taekwondo. And he said, I bet you I can hit that with my foot. And I said, bullshit. And he kicked it. And I was like, yeah, that's something I need to do. <laughs> you know, I, I need to be able to do that. That's cool. And, uh, you know, I, I went and trained and uh, uh, it opened up a lot of doors for me. You know, I, I did a lot of really cool things with it. So was Master Mike your first master? He was my only instructor. I only ever trained at his school. I've done seminars at other schools for different types right. of martial arts, uh, you know, st stick fighting and Brazilian jiu-jitsu and Aikido and Hapkido. Um, I, I did travel to other schools, but I never trained and paid tuition to another person other than Master Mike. Right. So your home school, yeah. your first school was your only school, basically. Yes. Yes. I didn't travel. Uh, I found it. It was uh, like the, the, the planets aligned and it was such a great place uh, up until he passed. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I had no need to go anywhere else. And it, it honestly, Bob, it's been hard on me since he died to, do any type of structured physical fitness. I go to the Y and I hate it. Um, you know, I look here, I went, we went to a couple different gyms, workout plus, and I, you know, I just, ugh, I just hate it. You know, it's not my thing. Is when that forever gym ceases to exist, then what the hell do you do? Yeah. 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 You know, I mean, and it was, you know, when I was, when I first started, I was going to every class I could. And, and when I became an intermediate rank, you know, um, halfway between beginning and black belt, I was, I was there right. six days a week because it was open six days. You know, I was, I was there all the time. Uh, and, you know, I made a lot of, I made a lot of new family members. I wouldn't even say they're friends. Uh, I made a lot of new family members from that school that, you know, we see we see them when we can and, and we hang out on the reg. So what do you think it was about Master Mike's school that, like, locked you in from the go? Well, from the go, in the beginning, it was an all-male school. Uh, we had maybe two girls, but it was a combat school. It was fighting. We didn't do forms, you know, we, we did push-ups, we did sit-ups, we ran, it was physical fitness. And then the, the, the rest of the hour and a half or two hours we trained was all sparring. 
Um, I, I remember being number one in the line and he had a drill where there was uh, six people in line and, you know, seven people, one and then six people. Right. And you sparred for a minute and then the person you were sparring went to the back of the line and the next person stepped up. So you sparred for six minutes straight. Yep. And then you swapped out the first person then basically. Right? Yeah. And then, you know, you've got, yeah. Then I went to the back of the line and, you know, I got a, a six minute break before I was fighting again, you know? So we had, so Tong Sudo is a, a Korean martial arts like Taekwondo, but we had a, like it with a sect mm-hmm. basically. So ours was Mudok Kwan. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like your yeah. Taekwondo was a Mudok Kwan type like military family virtue type setup where it was, it wasn't so much about the sport. It was about the, the discipline and the fighting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Master Mike started with Tang Sudo and uh, he was a black belt in Tang Sudo before he moved over to Taekwondo. Um, uh, I know uh, unless the people that listen to this, look at the picture of me, they don't really know I, people that would know me, you know, that listen to your podcast would say, Oh yeah, John's a big guy, but I, I'm, I'm fle- freakishly flexible. Like I, you know, if I stretch for a little bit, I'm fairly sure I could get back to doing splits. Like I, you know, I used to be able to do splits and for a big man, put my foot over top of my head and, you know, a, a lot of power, a lot of speed, um, but a lot of flexibility, which, Taekwondo was the right martial art for me because of the speed, the power, and the flexibility that I had. So it, it worked. Um, you know, he he went from uh, a handful of combat students, and he he trained us hard. You know, if you you know if he didn't like what you were doing, then you started doing push ups on top of bricks. You know, things like that, and you know, you right. get whacked in the back of the legs or the back of the shoulders with the shin eye if you weren't standing right. Uh, and, and then he realized that, you know, he couldn't make a living at this. So he, he turned it around and he made it more family, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Accessible. Sorry. And, uh, you know, there were classes where it went from, you know, 20 students to having like 35 black belts in one class. Uh, I mean, that's, that's huge. You know, like most schools, never even get 35 black belts. And he was having those in, in classes, you know, two or three nights a week. Um, and it, it really, you know, his, his leadership training classes that we took. Right. <laughs> Sunday and I, and uh, I guess the big thing for me was as a competitive martial artist and, and going to competitions and, and sparring and board breaking and all, and uh, being a, a bigger guy, uh, when he asked me to be one of his first full-time paid instructors, um, I was all excited. Yeah, I'll get the adult class and we'll start, you know, combat training and we'll get a competition team up. And he said, no, 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 you're going to take the kids. And I kind of laughed like, yeah, yeah, right. He's like, no, 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 you're going to take the kids class. And, you know, Bob, damn, if he wasn't right, you know, that was... I give up everything, every accolade that I ever had in a Taekwondo uniform to, to teach those kids again. Um, it, it was amazing. It was so powerful. Um, I, there's no, there's no kick or punch or choke or anything that I have that is as powerful as, as teaching kids and having them, you know, look up to you. And it wasn't that they feared me. You know, they, at that point I had, I had changed and, uh, you know, they, they respected me. They, I made it so that they wanted to learn from me and, you know, I'm a personable guy, Bob. And, um, it was, it was one of the most rewarding experiences in my life. And it was, uh, it's something I'll never forget. And I can never, ever thank him enough for, him seeing in, in me something that I didn't see, you know? Right. Oh yeah. You know? Well, how much did you learn from those kids oh, too? Like, how about that? Oh, you know, it was, <laughs> it was, it was amazing, Bob. I, I, I can't explain it. Like it, it's like, I got goose pump pimples thinking about it. Like I got, I'm all like, 
you know, teary eyed thinking about those kids, you know? Oh, no, it's awesome. And I, it, it's so funny because it's almost like in that true martial arts tradition. I mean, my first teaching was the yeah. little the little kid classes, too. And you you do. You learn so much. Uh-huh. It's like you get your, you know, oh, yeah. second degree black belt or whatever, where you start teaching. And when you start teaching those little kids, it's like, oh, man, I just like I just leveled up three levels from you know, teaching white belts. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and five-year-old Bible white belts at that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's very humbling. You know, um, the one thing he told me was, uh, everybody is the center of their own universe, you know, and if you can, if you can help somebody by teaching them, then you're changing an entire universe. Oh yeah. He said, think, think about, If you tell somebody, no, that closes so many pathways. But if you say to them, hey, I know you're trying your best. You're going to get this technique down. I believe in you. I have faith in you. Imagine how many thousands of doorways that opens up for somebody. And he's telling me this. And, you know, I mean, I'm the guy that, you know, used to collect money for people when I was younger. You know, I used to beat people up. And I was like, oh, my, oh, my God, that's amazing. Uh, you know, it was, uh, I, I can't say, I can't say enough about it. And it, it affects, it affects me to this day. It makes me be a better person, uh, makes me be a better husband, a better truck driver, better everything, anything that I want to do. I realize from the things that he taught me that I, I can accomplish. And, um, you know, I, there's no wall for me that I can't push to. And maybe even move right. that wall back an inch, you know, if, if I have to, you know, he's, you know, he trained, he trained us sometimes to where, you know, you get that, uh, that endorphin laugh because you're so tired oh, yeah. and you're so spent, but all you can do is, you know, your oxygen is like depleted down to 32% <laughs> in your body. And, you know, you're just, you're just laughing and you don't know why. And, you know. Uh, you know, it's, it's just, it was cool. It was cool. I can never, I can't thank him enough for that. And it's, it's a big part of who I was and it's an even bigger part of who I am and who I'm going to be, you know, uh, it just, uh, you know, it, it changed me. I was, I was a bit of a thug, you know, <laughs> I was, I was doing, I was doing, uh, I was doing naughty things when I, when I met him and he, you know, he helped focus me. Uh, he helped bring me out of the dark, uh, a lot. There was a lot of bad things I was doing. Um, and, and he just helped me get rid of that. I think martial arts is a huge outlet for that is to, you know, get you that focus mm-hmm. and, and give your idle mm-hmm. hands something to do. <laughs> True. True. You know, I mean, look at, Look at uh, the the big thing that's in the news right now. Did you see the thing with Diego Sanchez? Oh yeah, the nightmare. Oh yeah, how he like there were people tearing him down, saying what a has been. He got beat by a, a guy from Down syndrome, and I, I'm like, you. I didn't even know the whole story, but I'm like, you guys are idiots. There's no way that Diego Sanchez doesn't know this guy, and he's he took the loss. To give this guy that that feeling. Oh yeah, well he's a trainer. You know, two days later, this yeah, the, the story, the whole story comes out, and, and then everybody that was the naysayer is like, oh well, you know that's pretty cool. Well, you didn't have to, <laughs> you didn't have to say that in the first place, man. It's two plus two equals four, right. and you know he was being a nice guy, you know it's, you know, but it, I, that's that's the kind of martial artist I want to be remembered as, not not the the hammer I want to be known as uh, you know the sage and and I mean you know you know me from from maestros they call me brother sage because I I, I like to be known as a sage not a warrior you know well that is actually in my notes um, so we could probably jump to so we're, we're going to come back and fill in some other stuff but I know one of your one of your current ventures is being brother sage and why don't you go ahead and tell everyone with, with what is that all about uh, three years ago, uh, a family member of my wife, her cousin, said uh, posted something on the internet and said, uh, 
hey, I'm thinking about starting a speakeasy. And Sunday jumped on the bandwagon right away. Oh, I would love that. That's so cool. That's our kind of place. You know, I design websites. I can help you out. And that initial conversation has led to uh, where we are today with Maestro's Classic, which is a uh, it's uh, not just a beard grooming supply company. It's a movement. It's a uh, it's a lifestyle. It's not like, oh, I got a beard and I wear flannel. I'm a hipster. Um, you know, the, uh, the owner of the company ghost, um, he like master Mike is interested in making sure that he's helping as many people as he can. Um, maestros isn't just about selling products and making profit. Uh, they, they have an art house maestros that they do art shows for up and coming artists. Uh, he buys artwork from them. Uh, matter of fact, the next show that he's doing Sunday is going to have a room for her artwork. So she's going to be, uh, having an art show there, but they do a lot. Some of the, mo- Go ahead. is she showing her mosaics? Or yeah, other yeah stuff? mosaics and paintings and things that she has done and things that she's going to do. Uh, for the show. Nice. So yeah, it'll be, it'll be, she's going to have her own room. She's not going to share a room with somebody uh, because she's family and she's in on the ground floor with maestros. But uh, you know, he, he does a lot of work with haircuts for the homeless. Uh, he has a street team of barbers that, that go out in a van, they pull out chairs and they give haircuts and trim ups. And they have other people that come along and, and, you know, give the homeless people deodorant and shampoo and soap and toothbrushes and toothpaste. Um, and these, these, they give them a care package. They come out and they take care of them and they groom them up so that they don't look so homeless. You know, they, they don't look like a hobo or a bum or, and have people thinking that about them, you know, it makes them, makes the people that are having a tough time right now. It makes them feel better about themselves because they're, they get cleaned up. Well, um, yeah, it could be the impetus to a whole new start. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's big with that. Um, he's real big with uh, a, a group called Your Beard is Dope. And that is uh, a lot of major cities have chapters of Your Beard is Dope. And it's I'm not affiliated with it, but it is uh, it's uh, gay men and women uh you know, not that women have beards, but they, they hang out in, in gay clubs. Uh, and I hate using that word and I hate saying alternative lifestyle because I don't believe there's anything alternative about it. You know, that's right. their life and they're entitled to it. Um, but just for clarification, you know, that they have a, a card that says your beard is dope and they go up to a guy or a girl that they like and, Hey, you know, your beard is dope and it's, it's a way to break the ice for, for them. But it's, uh, I'm not affiliated with it because it's all young and at, right. at 50, you know, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 50 and I'm not gay. So I'm really not in there. Uh, you know, they're going to look at me kind of funny is what, you know, I think. So um, it's not where my talents are suited. Um, but I, I've met some of them down at the building, some of the guys from these, these groups and, I get along with them. I got no beef with them. Sure. Their, their life is their life, you know, and uh, uh, they're really nice people. And, and Anthony does a lot with them. Uh, you know, that's that's got to be hard coming out to people and saying, you know, living your life openly like that, because it's still a stigma with a lot of people. And, uh, you know, he he promotes you being you, you know, be the best that you can be, you know, undeniably good. And uh you know, that's, that's what's super appealing to me. I learn so much from, from him, uh, when I'm down there and I'm, I'm in a meeting, uh, it's kind of like, uh, I'm in school again and I'm listening, you know, I have the gift of gab and I can talk when we're, when we're down at a NASCAR event and we're selling, I sell the ass out of the product. I, you know, it's, it, that's my forte, but you know, being, uh, seeing as how these are all younger people um, and the business side of Maestro's when he 
lets me in on those meetings. Um, it, it opens my eyes a lot about, you know, there's a lot behind the scenes that I would never have thought of. Uh, things that he has to think of to keep the ship afloat, which it seems like it's got to be a constant hustle for them. I mean, they're in everything. It it is, it is, it is, and there are uh, there are things that we signed a, a no disclosure clause, so I can't tell you about. But there are gigantic things coming, gigantic, uh, huge. huge, stellar things coming, huge. Uh, yeah, so it's you know they they're. The beard product of the Sixers, they're down at every Sixers game, giving out free haircuts up on the concourse. Uh, he sponsors two boxers. And, uh, you know, with my martial arts background, I'm going to be part of the boxing team, going to the boxing events and the MMA events and promoting uh, our fighters. So that's going to be my next uh, my next chapter is I'm going to be on the uh, the combat sports team i guess you know he's got the sixers team and the nascar team i'm on the nascar team um you know so i'll I'll be i'll be helping him with this you know uh i've i've loved boxing my father got me interested in boxing when i was younger i actually no lie bob (laughs) i know this sounds crazy but i competed in a tough man competition you remember that uh back in the early 90s that three round fights you remember those with the yellow? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, oh, yeah. I competed in two of those. I, I won two fights. And then, uh, you know, my first weekend down in Maniunk, I won two fights. And then they said the next Saturday, you got to come next Saturday. And next Saturday, as an over-the-road truck driver, I was, you know, like in Lincoln, Nebraska. You know? <laughs> so I couldn't make it. So I had to forfeit. But I competed in that. And I, I won. I won two. I was two and out. Oh. <laughs> So you used to do OTR? Yeah, yeah. When I was younger, I was I was a I was an over the road truck driver. I've been in all lower forty eight states. Uh, the only state I've never driven in is Alaska. I drove a car in Hawaii, so that counts. <laughs> um, you know, like I can't say I drove a truck in Hawaii, but I drove a car in Hawaii um, on the Big Island. But yeah, never never been to Alaska, but. All lower 48 I've been to all across America. I spent, uh, oh, I guess I spent my first six, maybe seven years, you know, before I met Sunday and, and, uh, settled down. I, I spent that time across America, uh, you know, just traveling. Uh, the longest that I was away from my apartment was something like seven months. Oh, wow. I just, you know, well, you know, uh, I was single and uh, I was out in America, you know, and I was I was traveling, sleeping, sleeping in a different state every night and eating different foods every night. And, you know, just living life and a, a very romantic thing, you know, when, you know, like a free spirit type thing when I was younger. And, and uh, you know, uh, I loved it. You know, it was, it was amazing, but it was, it was time to be done with that. And I came home and, uh, then I, <laughs> I spent like 12 years, uh, driving a tractor trailer, you know, around New York, up in the five boroughs and upstate and out of Long Island. And, uh, that's where, uh, that's where my high blood pressure comes from, <laughs> you know? So, how did you, all right. So how do you, do you make that choice? Like, was it about the romanticism of the road to be a, a truck driver? Like, how does that, like, how did you make that choice? Um, uh, let's see. I was 18 and I got my class three operators license, which, uh, was what the CDL was before it was a CDL. Um, right. and I was dating somebody and we broke up and I was like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm out. <laughs> so I can't even remember who I was dating. I think it was a girl named Louise. Um, and I was like, yeah, there's, you know, I got an apartment. I got a motorcycle. I got a truck. I got a jet ski. What am I doing? Um, you know what? <clears throat> Out. So I sold everything. Uh, the stuff I wanted, I put in storage. Um, I kept my apartment, but, uh, you know, there was no food in the fridge and, you know, just cans of soup and stuff like that and cereal in the cupboards. And I grabbed my cat and hit the road and that was it. 
So you know, that's all. I just want it to be gone. Were you driving local before then, or what were you doing like career wise before that though? <laughs> Yeah, when you're eight, I was working for a lumber company. When you're 18 with this uh, with a class three or a CDL, uh, when you're 18, you can't leave the state. So I couldn't leave Pennsylvania until I was 21. So from 18 to 21, I had truck driving jobs that just kept me in Pennsylvania. Um, the one was with uh, the the big one I had for a lot of years was with uh, Triangle Building Centers. And I was traveling all over Pennsylvania for them, going to their different stores and um, uh, delivering uh, kitchen cabinets for them to their different stores all over Pennsylvania. I think they had like nine, ten stores, you know, uh, Chambersburg and York and Wilkes-Barre and Scranton and Philly and Quakertown and Erie and, you know, Oh, wow. So you were stem to stern. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was, I was gone, uh, overnight a couple of times a week. Uh, you know, but like I said, I was, it was just me and the cat, you know, that was all, that was it. Just the two of us. And, uh, so you took the cat on the road. Oh yeah. Yeah. She rode with me wherever I went, you know, when, when I turned 21 and I got rid of all of my stuff, um, you know, I, I took her with me. And she lived long enough that she met Sunday. I mean, the cat was really old, uh, but Sunday, Sunday knew Belly. Sunday knew my cat. Uh, unfortunately, the, the cat passed away several years ago. Um, and we had to put her down because she just was way too old. Um, and now we have these two idiots, you know. <laughs> so my wife was... My wife, after we put Belly down, she's like, I, we can't have a quiet house. I need a cat. And we got these two. And that's okay. He's a little, he's crazy and, you know, he's loud. But the girl cat, Misty, she's, she's a good cat. She loves me. Um, just like Belly. Belly was a female too. Um, you know, but Belly used to go with me over the road, sleep on the, sleep on the dashboard, you know, of my freight liner. Um, I had a litter box for her and she never wanted to get out of the truck, you know, just occasionally she would come down and, you know, sniff around the truck and look at me and I put her back in the truck and she'd go back to sleep. You know, she didn't, she just wanted to be around me. She didn't want to go far from me. So what's one of the craziest, uh, like OTR stories? Do you oh, okay. Um, uh, the first time that I saw tornadoes is a scary, scary thing. Okay. Now we're going back in time to the point where there were no cell phones. Okay. I didn't have a cell phone when I was over the road. I had a beeper. And for all you young kids, <laughs> it's a little box that you clipped on your belt and it had a, an LCD display. And usually you typed in your phone number and then you hit 911. And sent the, the, the code 911 if you needed someone to call you back right away. So I had a, a, a pager. I didn't have a cell phone and I carried a Polaroid camera with me, uh, for accidents. You know, those before even disposable cameras. I had to carry a Polaroid and I was driving. I was in Nebraska and the town, this little tiny town. Uh, I can't remember the name right now, but it was, I remember it. It's clearly, it's a one lane coming and going right through the center of town. And I drove right through a Ku Klux Klan rally <laughs> and no lie. Right. So uh, I had my windows down and on the CB, you could hear them and they were spouting their gospel and they were, uh, you know, being racist towards, uh, black drivers and, and Mexican drivers and Jewish drivers and all. And they were stopping trucks and they had a, a flatbed trailer right on the, uh, the shoulder of the road. And you'd pull up to the light and they would want to hand you uh, literature. So somewhere in my collection of stuff, somewhere in either my house or my parents' house, I believe that I still have the photo of, it's a Polaroid 
of a Ku Klux Klan member with his hood reaching through my passenger window to hand me a pamphlet. Oh, shit. He was handing it to me, and I snapped his photo <laughs> with my Polaroid because in 30 years of driving, that has never happened to me a second time. And I I have a, 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 a Polaroid of a Klan's member reaching <laughs> through my window to hand what me a pamphlet. What year was this? You know? Ballpark. Um, God, that would have been early 90s, 92, wow. 93. You know, back then, yeah, yeah. Before before cell phones with pagers, before, you know, when Polaroid still made cameras and, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Do you know they actually still do? And apparently they cost a shit ton of money now. I think I saw one on Amazon for 120 bucks, but it's new. Yeah, the um, there was one at the Adobe Max that's a Fuji that's like crazy, like 499 dollars, and that does that for a Polaroid. Yeah, for oh my God. yeah, and it's the cartridge is like six photos, and the cartridge is like 45 dollars. And so no, now I, that I, is not good. I get it if you need it for. Um, if you need to have some sort of film documentation. Uh, so as a truck driver, uh, I have to carry, I, I carry on my own a disposable camera because if I have an accident, digital prints are not admissible in court. Because they can be modified. They can be modified. And you, you would be one of the people that would know about it. And my wife would be exceptional with that, <laughs> you know? So <laughs> I, did not, exactly. I have to have film photo uh, photographs for, you know, empirical proof of what happened, you know? What about dash so cam? A, does your truck have a dash cam in it? No, it does not. It does not. No. Okay. No, I'm, I'm, I'm on the fence about that. Um, you know, as a truck driver, sometimes I got to do things that, you know, might make other people squeamish, you know, you pull up a little close and blow your horn. Come on, get out of the way. I'm working. I, you know, if you got to go pick up Johnny at the pool, do it on your own time. Get the hell out of my way. I got to work. You know, I'm right. I have and you deadlines. don't want that on dash cam, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's, I mean, I have deadlines. Every, we all do. Um, I'm totally against cameras facing the driver. I, I'm totally against that. Uh, you know, that's an evasion of my privacy, but I have seen where dash cameras have, you know, save drivers from being in trouble pertaining to access. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, but I, I believe there's some sort of law about them, you know, with being video cameras and uh, being digital after an accident, you have to give the whole system to the cop as a safeguard and, you know, like a GoPro, if you have a GoPro. Shut up, Neelix. Shut up, Neelix. See? <laughs> He only, it only takes two that he shuts off. Um, but you gotta, you gotta surrender the whole system, uh, so that, you know, there's no tampering, uh, but you know, I, I'm fine without it. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't do too much crazy shit. I'm too old for that. Well, we got off on a little tangent there. I want to get back to the crazy truck mm -hmm. driving story because after the Klansmen, I thought there was going to be something about some multiple tornadoes or something. You said tornadoes, plural. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Um, same, same period of time, early nineties. And, uh, it was night and I was going to, I was going to a mall and I had to deliver to the mall after it closed because it was, um, I was delivering the kiosk for their new piercing pagoda. If you remember that, that was a, a, a kiosk in the mall there. You oh, could get yeah. your ears pierced. And, uh, you know, the fir very first time I heard the tornado warning on the phone uh, over the radio, sorry. And it's, you know, there's a tornado touchdown in some county. And I, I have no idea what county that is. I'm not from there. So I, you know, I have no idea where this tornado is. Is it behind me? Is it beside me? Am I driving into it? And uh, it's farmland, and this, hmm, 
I guess for lack of better term, swarm of beetles came out of a field because like locusts. No, these were beetles. Okay. Um, maybe bow weevils. <laughs> I don't know. Cause it was rainy. It was dark, but I'm, you know, I'm driving along and I see this big black cloud. It's not a tornado. And next thing you know, my truck is covered in these. They were bigger than a ladybug, but smaller than a stink bug. Um, and my truck's covered in them. You know, they're, they're all over the windshield. They're all over the hood. I had to, you know, stop and, and try to get over as best as I could. And I'm windshield wipering and it's getting that, you know, it's smearing the bug guts all over the windshield, you know, and it's, <laughs> you know, now there's a tornado somewhere. It's getting dark. And now I'm panicked because what's chasing all of these beetles out of this field right. that was off to my right. You know what I'm saying? It's I'm in a bad spot. I don't know what's going on, but I'm in a bad spot. And uh, I got the, the windshield cleaned all off. It started going and and there was two or three tornadoes in the field right next to me. And uh, I was like, yeah, yeah, it's time for us to go. Come on, let's go. <laughs> let's. Yeah, we need to put some distance between us and those things, you know. Oh, I would have crapped my pants. Yeah, I, you know, I might have. I might have. <laughs> um, but the, with tornadoes, the, the sky turns a bright green, like a, a like a, a, almost like a neon, um, like nuclear waste type, you know. Uh, right, right, right. Uh, Prestone antifreeze green. Like the whole sky is green. And I'm like, what? you know, the first time seeing this and, I'm in my twenties and I'm like, I'm going to fucking die here. (laughs) I don't know what's going on, but everything seems to be lining up that this is John's last day on earth, you know, and, uh, stopped at the hotel in Eau Claire after we unloaded the piercing pagoda in the mall. (laughs) And, uh, the next day the tornado came through town and it was like, uh, the other side of town and it, it came, it, it hit the other side of town where I was staying um, uh, 10, 15 blocks, maybe away. And it, it tore up the, uh, some of the buildings in town there. And I was, you know, I was like, yeah, it, time for me to go. Uh, I'm going home. I had enough. Thanks. <laughs> you know, this is, this is not for me. This is, yeah, I'm not that brave. I got to go, you know? It oh, was, that's crazy. It, it was a very, you know, I've seen some really crazy things. Uh, uh, Driving through the desert, um, out past Utah and, uh, driving along and it's pitch black and it's straight and there's before satellite radio, there's no radio, there's nothing on the CB and I'm driving along and driving along. And during the day, you'll see billboards that say next exit, you know, 680 miles must fuel up now. Right. Right. So the speed limit was 60, you know, so do the math, you know, that's, that's, you know, 11 hours to go one exit out through the desert. You know, there's nothing. And, uh, I'm driving along and it's night and, uh, I look over to my left and I, I see this light and I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe it's a town. Um, and it's getting really bright. It's like a bright white, and I'm thinking, holy shit, this is so cool. There's like a hidden army base out here, you know? <laughs> oh my God, this is amazing. It's it's right out right out past my shoulder. It's right out there in a the distance. It's almost like I could touch it. And 20 minutes later, it was the moon rising up. Oh, full moon. wow. And it, I, I spent the rest of the night watching it climb up in the sky and, and, and go overhead and, uh, you know, I wound up pulling over in a rest area uh, when the sun was coming up so that I could sleep. Wow. Yeah. So it's, yeah, I've, I always tell people when they ask me stuff about my life, I say, if someone else was telling me this, I would be really skeptical. I'd be like, ah, that's bullshit, dude. You did not see the moon. You did not scuba dive with sharks in Australia. You did not punch Russell Crowe, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I've, I've had that kind of charmed life. I've had that kind of exciting, adventureful life. And, uh, 
it's been a really, it's been really cool. I enjoy every day. Uh, even, even when I'm having a bad day, you know, I, I know that I'm super blessed, um, in my life. I, I got a lovely wife who will take care of me at the drop of a hat, who has my best interest at heart. I've got great friends, uh, all over the world. You, the guys from Embraco in Denmark, uh, you know, uh, Nick and Amy, people in Philly, my family, you know, um, so I'm, I'm really blessed. I, I don't really want for anything, um, except maybe to, you know, pass on some of the knowledge I had and some of the adventures and Sunday keeps telling me I need to write a book. I totally you know, so think, I totally think you should be writing a book. Yeah. Yeah. That's what she says too. You should be writing a book, you know, the, the stuff that you've done, the, you know, the way that you are, um, you know, you, people will live vicariously through me, you know? So we'll see. That may be an adventure. Well, without a doubt. That, that could That's be why I wanted you to be on here is because I wanted everyone to live vicariously through you. Oh, um, sweet. So you mentioned Denmark mm-hmm. and in my show notes. I have written King of Denmark because I know that that is a um, I know that's a a story Uh and you do have friends all over the world. But Mm -hmm. I I want you to share a little bit of how the King of Denmark story goes. Um, Well, it it starts pre Umbraco, okay, uh, at Adobe Max when uh, Sunday met. Martin, Thomas, and David from Denmark. Three really nice guys, really quiet, but they're super talented and uh, they're super friendly and they got along with Sunday and they met me and we hit it off like we were family forever. You know, like we were, they were super nice. We got along great. We were hanging out and, uh, we got invited to Umbraco um, because of you uh, working with Sunday. You were like, you should go to this Umbraco. You need yes. to go to this training. And she came home and said, Hey, I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to Denmark. <laughs> and I said, yeah, when do we leave? Uh, you know, I'm going to Denmark with you. And uh, it was Sunday who coined the phrase. She's like, these people are not ready for you. You know, the Danish people are, kind of reserve and, and laid back and quiet. And (laughs) you're going to go there and you're going to be the King of Denmark in like three days, you know? So she's the one that she's the one that coined the phrase. And, um, you and I have been in Denmark together and we've had, uh, uh, unmeasurable amounts of fun there. Um, and I have nothing, I have nothing to do with, that world. I'm a truck driver. I have nothing to do with computers. And I, I tell Sunday all the time, I say, you know, in some circles, you're just my wife. And, and Brocco's one of them, you know, they, uh, you know, Pierre, Pierre and Nils, they, they love me. Uh, they love Sunday too. Um, and, and, you know, I'm a non-computer guy and I have two pictures downstairs in the basement and the employee <laughs> and the employee, you know, wall where all the employees have pictures they have two pictures of me hanging up, you know, so Sunday, yes. Sunday's like, they don't have a picture of me. And I'm like, well, you know, in some circles, you're did, just my wife, you know. Did she tell you that Pear is leaving? She did. She did. And I, I had a, a little conversation with him uh, on um, Messenger. Yeah. Not, not not the green and white app on the phone, the blue and white one. I was like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear you're leaving her. Are you Okay do you need me to come over there and break somebody's legs for you? And he's just was like, no, 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 no. It's all good. I'm, I got a new adventure. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm excited to move on. And, and he built, he did, he just build a new house. Him, he built one and Nils built one. Um, uh, you would know that better than me. Huh? Yeah. I think he built this really nice rustic Danish cottage type castle. Uh, it's bigger than a cottage, but it looks like a cottage. It's, it's a nice house. I've seen pictures of it. I've never been there. Um, but he was just, you know, well, I'm going to go, I want to live, you know, and, uh, you know, okay. Sorry to see you go. He goes, oh, well, you know, you'll see me a code garden. 
yep. you know, I'll, I'll be a code guard and I'm still going to be around. So here's hoping, here's hoping that, that everything is okay and that there wasn't a falling out, but it didn't sound like there was. Nah, they had a really nice uh, farewell video that he and mm-hmm. Niels did together. So mm-hmm. Sweet. Well, all right. So yeah, the one last thing that I want to, the one last thing that I want to cover is, that we haven't covered yet is comedy. So oh, okay. you got the stand-up thing that you're doing, and and I want to hear um, more about that. And I'm sure everyone else does as well. So, okay. so first of all, how did you get into it? Um, I, I tell you what, Bob. Um, it takes a certain mindset to stand up and be in front of people. I, I know you've done it. You know, Adam Brocco, you've you've been up there speaking in front of people. Um. So let me just change the gears for a second. How did how did you feel having to do that? Did you feel comfortable or was it a little nerve wracking in the beginning? I, you know, how did that make you feel? It's totally uncomfortable, but it's uncomfortable in a way that I like. Like mm-hmm. I wouldn't I wouldn't do it if it didn't bring me joy. But mm-hmm. part of that joy is the uncomfortableness. I like mm-hmm. being that having that stress. Um, it's just weird, Sweet. I guess, but. <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's not weird. Uh, um, I don't ever feel that stress. You know, um, occasionally if I'm opening for somebody big and by big, I mean, you know, a comic that's on the rise up in New York City. I'm not opening for Lisa Lampanelli or anybody like that. I'm, I'm still a small fish. Um, but, I, you know, I could talk the paint off a barn. Uh, I can talk to anybody and I'm totally comfortable with it. You know, I, you know, even as a kid uh, coming up uh, playing football and, and being in the scouts and being a leader when I was a a scout, uh, I was the senior patrol leader. So I, I ran most of the meetings. Um, You know, I, I just always have been able to be in front of people and, and, um, be comfortable with it. And, uh, I had a job, I was working for a company and I got downsized and that's a polite way of saying fired. (laughs) Um, there's, there's, you know, there's differing stories. One person says that I threatened his wife and kids and said I was going to drink their blood. Another person said they were going to hire two Mexicans over me. The, The truth is the company was on the way down and I didn't get fired. I got downsized. You know, it's, I was a top, I was a top paid guy and they got rid of a lot of us, you know, so there's all these different rumors going around about me. Um, and uh, when I got downsized, no uh, I, for, for a couple of months, I was a letter carrier for the post office because I wanted something, I wanted something completely different. And I remember going through the training, saying, man, I could do this. This is good pay. You know, I'm in the union. This is going to be great. And then I got to my post office and I was like, yeah, I mean, I could see me doing this. This is, this is great. And three days later, I was like, yeah, I could see me doing this for a couple of years. And then the <laughs> next day, I was like, yeah, I could see me doing this for a couple of months. And then the day after that, it was like, yeah, I don't know about this. And then Friday, I was like, yeah, I quit <laughs> because it was, uh, it was management. Um, the job, I liked it, but it was management treats the union workers atrocious at the post office. And I, I'm the kind of person I'm not going to be talked to like that. So I knew someone was going to get the Russell Crowe treatment and I didn't want to be in trouble for that. So, you know, I called Sunday and said, yeah, I can't do this anymore. She will come on home. And, uh, I was just like, yeah, today's my last day. I'm done. Bye. I won't, I won't be in tomorrow. See ya. Goodbye. Um, and I, you know, we were talking and, uh, she said, uh, you want to do something different? And so she found me a school in San Francisco to become a United States tour guide. I'd be a licensed tour guide for the United States. Um, you know, I'd be able to work at, uh, right. any state park in America, um, as a non park ranger, but as a tour guide. Um, so I wouldn't be armed and I wouldn't have the Smokey, the bear hat or the uniform, but, uh, you know, like city hall, I would be able to give tours about city hall after I passed the initial training course and then took the training course for city hall or 
at, at a Mount Rushmore or the Grand Canyon or, you know, Yellowstone or, or wherever there's a tour guide for uh, the United States, um, I'd be able to do that. So we were getting my finances together. I was going to move to San Fran. Uh, it was a two month course and Sunday was cool with it. And then the recruiter called me and said, Hey, I want to know how you feel about it. I got a job lined up. I think you'd be great for you. You're a great, uh, you're a personable guy. And um, it's taking a Whoa. church group and you'll be going all over uh, uh, the Pacific Rim, you know, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, Fiji, blah, blah, blah. And it's like a three month thing. And I said, yeah, I'd love to. And Sunday said, yeah, he's not coming to school. And that was it. <laughs> you're not going there without me. You're not, you're not getting a job traveling all over America and all over the world without me. Um, so she found me Chuck McKibben, who I did voiceover work with. Uh, Chuck, um, Chuck uh, studied under Mel Blanc. He was one of his uh, backups. Uh, Chuck wrote the Chesterfield cigarette commercials for Vincent Price and John Wayne. He produced those. Uh, he has a daytime Emmy for his uh, radio work, things like that. Um, it's, I guess it's not a daytime Emmy. That's probably the wrong word. But he has a, a, an award that looks like an Emmy. He actually has two of them for his radio work. The roundabout thing I'm saying is that uh, <laughs> I always wanted to do something different every year. That's my New Year's resolution. And uh, we found a, a comedy class. I took it. And I started doing stand up and I love it um, being in front of the crowd. And, you know, there's not too many places where you can get paid to tell someone, hey, man, I'm standing up here doing jokes. Shut the fuck up. You know, <laughs> you know, um, so it's uh, I like it. It's it's fun. It, it feeds my creative need. Um, it keeps my wife happy that I'm being creative and that I'm doing something other than sitting around playing games on my phone or watching TV. She likes that I get out and do things. Oh, nice. Um, a lot of my friends, uh, local are very supportive of me. You know, whenever I'm doing a show at, at the Bethlehem casino or at, uh, the brew works or any of those, you know, the winery that I, I, I'm the opening, uh, I'm the headliner comic at uh, the blue Valley winery on their house comic, whenever they do a, a show, which is every like three or four months. Um, yeah. So I, you know, they come visit, they come, they get in the audience and people like that. I, you know, I'm the kind of guy that I, I promote and I bring stuff to the table and I'm funny and I enjoy it. And it, I guess it shows because I, I have a really good time with it and I have a small following. Uh, most of them are friends, but I have some people that follow me. So how long is your set these days? Uh, most of it is like 10 minutes. You know, I, like I said, I'm not, I'm not the, uh, I'm not the headliner doing the hour show. Uh, when I work at the Blue Valley Winery up in Sailorsburg, uh, I'm scheduled to do 10 minutes, but I usually wind up doing about 45. <laughs> um, I just get on a roll and the promoter, Cody, just go for it. He's, he says, I'm not going to stop you. You, you have the crowd every time you do the show, it's new material. The crowd loves you. It's always a different crowd. Uh, there are some people that come to every show, uh, friends of mine and family of mine and friends and family of his that come to every show. But 90% of the people are, are always different, different people. And, uh, the thing for me is I, I like walking out on stage and not knowing what I'm going to do because I don't know the crowd. So you, yeah. So you don't have pre-written material? No, no. Everything is every all my comedy for the most part. I have some bits that help me carry through, but most of my comedy that I do is right wow. there, as it comes to me in my head and and um, what I say and how I say it and to who I say it is depending on where I'm at and and who's sitting there, uh, you know, and that's. I, I, I excel at crowd work is what they call it. You know, my, uh, a lot of my comic friends are like, dude, I wish to God I had your crowd work. I really do. He said, your crowd work is, is just, I've never seen anybody like it. You know, that, that you could talk to people and, 
and that's my comedy. I don't write it down. I just remember it. Um, <laughs> I go over it before a show or what I want to say. And depending on what time of year it is, you know, like right now I have a bit about uh, it's fat guy season, you know, oh, all summer long. Don't go to the beach. Oh, my back hair is a scandal. Right. But now you're cold. Fuck you, you skinny bitch. Now you freeze. You know, snuggling up with me, you know. So, you know, it's things like that. I, but you can't pull that off during the summer. You know, that's a winter bit. Um, you know, but yeah, I enjoy the comedy. And, and I, it's, uh, I just love, I love the adventure of it. I love the spontaneity of it. Um, and, and that's... <laughs> Uh, that's how I like to live my life. I was telling Nick and Amy up in New York, I said, you know, I always view it as, uh, the water, water cooler Olympics. You know, you, you get to the, you get to the water cooler on Monday and one guy says, ah, oh, I went to a ball game. Oh, we had a kid's birthday party. Oh, I went to a movie. What'd you do? Oh, I was in Tasmania and I punched Russell Crowe in the face. Holy shit. You know, oh my God. What? What? Say that again. You know what I mean? And, you know, like I told you earlier, if somebody else was saying this, I wouldn't believe it. And some of the people that are listening to this podcast may say, ah, this guy's full of shit. But there are other people that have met me and know me and go, totally. He totally punched Russell Crowe in the face. I know this guy. I know that's that fits. You know, I can't say that I'm. I'm doing a hundred burpees. You know, you know what size I am. You know, I'm a big guy. I can't say I fit into 32 size jeans, you know, but if I say I punch Russell Crowe in the face, there are people that are going to go. Yeah, I, I believe that. I don't see where that's wrong. You know, that's, that's his, that's his wheelhouse. You know, that's who he was. That's totally John. And um, part of the reason why you're on the show, brother. what's that? Say it again. I didn't hear that. I said, Part of the reason why you're on the show, brother. Ah, well, you know, I thought it was out of love. Well, that too, um, but awesome stories yeah. for sure. Yeah, you know, I, um, you know, I don't want to leave a clean corpse when I die. You know, <laughs> I want people to look at it and go, "Wow, that's been lived in." You know, <laughs> wow, that guy. You know, that's amazing. And, um, you know, I, I, uh, I'll share this with you. My something coming up for me. Uh, but you can't tell anybody, all right, Bob? This is a secret. All right. Totally between the two of us. Just between the two of us. I, <laughs> I um, in February, I'm going to be talking with my mentor, Chuck McKibben. And I am moving towards recording my very first album yes. of, loun- of lounge hits, you know? Um, oh, speaking of which, I still haven't received my uh, Kickstarter CD. I will get that to you. We ha- I have them. I-, I will get that to you. No problem. That'll that's done. That'll that'll get done. I'll have when when do you go back into work Sunday? Hello. Tomorrow. Uh oh. Yeah. Oh, there's a problem with her headphones. I think it, I, it went in and out. But can you hear me now? Okay. Um. You said you're going into work tomorrow, Sunday? I work from home tomorrow. Uh, can you mail a CD to Bob tomorrow? A uh, uh, matzo ball turn CD? Sure. She says, sure. She'll mail it out tomorrow. Perfect. So wait, so then this would mm-hmm. be your first solo CD that you're working on in February. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, um, it, it's like this. Do you remember that song? Uh, when I start to sing it, you'll, you'll remember it from the eighties. Uh, so I'm going to move out to the left for a while and I'm going to slide to the right for a while Oh, yes. and I can get up and back. Hey, I'm right on track, you know? <laughs> so, so you're going to take, so you're going to take old pop music and turn it into lounge. I'm thinking that's the way to go. And it's, it's not like I'm going to try to be a, a successful singer. It's, just another adventure, you know, it's, I love it. Why not? You know? So yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to give that an attempt in February, you know, uh, you know, maybe even a little Rick Ashley, never going to give you up, never going to let you down. So how would people listening to the podcast, uh, keep up with you and find out like where they could download this album or purchase it? Um, 
No, I still have to work that out. However, uh, one of my good comic friends, Glenn Tickle, uh, owns Circus Trapeze Records. Um, that's what he wanted to name his daughter was Circus Trapeze. <laughs> uh, yeah, so his wife said no, so he started a record album, and he, he just does comedy albums. Uh, but I'm going to talk to him and be like, hey, it's it's all online. Um, he's got the connection already. And if I record the files and give it to him, Hey, can, you know, can we sell this on circus trapeze? And I don't see where he would say no. And, you know, he gets a cut of the money if it, if it does anything. So exactly, you know, and I'm, I'm just doing it just for fun, you know, that's great. Yeah. Well, buddy, we are about an hour and 15 minutes in. How did that feel? I felt good. I felt good. You know, I, I, I don't have any problem talking, Bob. I got a problem shutting up, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, you know that. One of the things that I tell all my guests is I reserve to the right to recall you as a witness. Okay. So, so we might have to do this again sometime. Okay. Hopefully not as quick on the turnaround as Sunday and I had to do it. Um, mm-hmm. But that's a whole nother controversial topic. But the last yeah, thing I that tried I asked, to not be controversial. Yeah, go ahead. You did great. The last question that I ask is, who do you think that we both know would be a good guest to have on this show? Who do I think that yes. we both know yes. would be a good guest on the show? Um, oh, you know who would be good? That crazy son bitch, James. You remember Hot Tub James? James, James South? Is that his last name? Yeah, the the uh, Irish Make Australian it. guy or yes. Scottish Australian guy. Yes, I think he would be good. He's, I think he would be too. He's uh, unusual, you know. And that's <laughs> there's no there's no malice there. I like him. I smell my own kind, you know. Oh yeah, <laughs> so, and he's got plenty of plenty of backstory too with all of his different uh, software adventures. Mm-hmm. So yeah, no, yeah. that'd be great. Yeah. You know, I well, I know we know a lot of Imbraco people together, and um, where is their they're uh, a good partying bunch? They seem like they might not have that many adventures. <laughs> you know, you know, uh, and I'm being nice. I'm not being rude. You know, I love my Imbraco family, but it's just you know, you know, like I said, it, it just seems like that. You know, like hmm. You know, I'm sure people look at me and go, what the hell is he doing here? You know, oh, John's getting his nails painted and getting the, <laughs> his wet nails stuck in a drag queen's hair, you know, <laughs> and you were there for that. So, you know, that was true. You know, yes, that was 100 um, percent true. Uh, Just like everything else we've talked about. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No lie. No lie. Eagle Scout honor. You know, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and I'm going to say thank you for being on the show. Mm-hmm. Of course, and, Bob. Uh, I love you. You know, I, I'm happy to, to help you out in anything. I love you too, buddy. Um, so I'll give you the chance to uh, depart with some uh, words of wisdom for all of our listeners. Um, words of wisdom. Um, hmm. Four score and seven years ago, our founding fathers brought forth a plan. And the plan is be excellent to one another. That's what we should all do. We should all be excellent to, to each other. I love it. That's what, that's what our founding fathers wanted from us, to be excellent to each other. And that's what we should be. All right, brother. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right. Wow. That was lots of fun. Uh, great conversation with John Coulter today. Just another big thanks to John for being on the show. Uh, Can't wait to have him on again because there's so much that we still need to cover about uh, his amazing life. Big shout out to this week's sponsors, Social Imposter. You can check them out at socialimposter.com. And also uh, can't say enough about uh, the Bob and Kevin show. So be sure to check us out on YouTube every Monday morning at 8 a.m. Eastern time. All right. So until next week. It's been fun. Have a great one.